I think that while not too many people would vote for Data East as their absolute favourite arcade games company, they are the sort who have a whole lot of memorable games under their belt, partly because their best titles are very high quality indeed, but also because they can be somewhat, well, strange. Data East often really tried to cater to Western audiences, but they could do so in quite unconventional ways, or just beat to the sound of their own drum. For example, most game studios would probably choose a somewhat universal, inoffensive figure to act as their company's mascot. Data East chose a burly Russian strongman, because that's just how they roll. From justifiably famous classics to a whole lot of crude cassette games, the occasional hit of licensed goodness to the completely surreal titles where you may end up playing as a sheep, there's quite a lot to enjoy about Data East's arcades, and plenty to be intrigued by. So this video is an A to Z, specifically it's covering Data East's arcade games from the 1980s and there's 96 of them to go through. Yeah, quite a lot, including games from other studios that they distributed in certain territories as well as ones they fully made themselves. I feel like the A to Z is the best format for this because, much like the games from the company, you'll never quite fully know what's coming next as we jump around the timeline. Obviously there'll be some games you know, but I'm sure as well there's some that you would never possibly expect any studio ever to put out. Even if they didn't necessarily strike gold every time out, Data East was a fantastic company, and no other studio was quite like them. So let's get going. Our first two games are, well perhaps not the most exciting. 18 Challenge Pro Golf and 18 Holes Pro Golf are two rather early golf games indeed, from 1982 and 1981. As you might expect, they are pretty simplistic. They mainly just come down to hitting the button at the right time, with minimal control over the direction you hit the ball in. And yeah, that's it. Neo Turf Masters this sure isn't, but this sort of game is what you'll find with a lot of Data East's early arcades that came on their Deco cassette system, cartridges containing small size arcade games that could be swapped out pretty easily by operators. A fair few classics were released as part of the system, but there's also games like this one. Don't worry, things will get more exciting pretty sharpish. Acrobatic Dogfight from 1984 is a game published by Data East and developed by Technos Japan, a studio that actually started its life thanks to a trio of staff members who broke off from Data East in 1981. After initial disputes over an apparently stolen code, the two companies would end up working together a fair bit, and what we have here is essentially a more cartoonish version of Konami's Time Pilot. It's not as good a game as Konami's, but it has an amusing look and at least gives you a bit of a chance to salvage fins if you get hit. It's likely that you'll die in quite spectacular fashion, mind you. A fairly decent title. The amusing thing about doing an A to Z is that our next game, Act Fancer from 1989, is actually the third in a trilogy, the Evolution series of games that also consists of shoot 'em ups Darwin 4078 and Super Real Darwin. Act Fancer is also a much better game than both of those. Like the Darwin titles, the gimmick is that in powering up, you evolve and take on different forms while also wielding more powerful weapons, ideally being able to cause severe destruction if you survive long enough. Naturally, all this will disappear if the enemy manages to get you. There's some spectacular and somewhat naughty bosses here, generally fine presentation. So yeah, this is a really good Data East game, and I'm kind of surprised it didn't get any ports outside of the arcade. An arcade fishing game from the early 1980s? <laughs> sure, why not? Data East are more than happy to provide such a thing with Angler Dangler, a deco cassette game from 82. 
Much like Sega Bass Fishing so many years later, this gives the relaxing pastime of fishing a welcome arcade hit. You cast your line out, catch a fish quickly, and then you have to carefully manoeuvre said fish back to the bank, trying not to snag your line on any objects or land, and also not reeling in too much at once, otherwise your line will break. Obviously a bigger fish is going to be a lot more challenging than a tiddler, and there's a fair bit of momentum that you've got to deal with. Quite a likeable little arcade, to be honest. Astro Fantasia from 81 is a good old-fashioned space shooter. However, it does have a little twist, that being its rather crude yet effective pseudo-3D viewpoint where you're fighting over a space station. Enemies come down at you from the large mothership at the top, very much in a Gallagher sort of style. You take them out, and then you move away from the space station to take on the mothership itself in a more traditional top-down battle. It's a pretty good little fixed shooter, I must say. Not bad at all for a deco cassette game. Astro Fighter is the earliest game in this whole video. In fact, it was originally released in 1979 in Japan. However, the North American version came out in 1980, so I'm counting it, and besides, Data East have a lot of shoot 'em ups, so it's good to see how they began. Astro Fighter was also their first hit of any significance, and it's easy to see why. We still largely have the Space Invaders formula with waves of ship gradually descending as one big lump, but the patterns do differ somewhat. The enemies are now going to break away from each other a little bit. There's also a time of sorts. In order to complete a level, you must take out five different waves of alien ship before your fuel runs out, and if you let so much as one alien reach the bottom of the screen, then the wave will start over. Meanwhile, you also have to deal with diagonal shots and asteroids. Taking out all five waves in the strict time limits can be pretty tough, it must be said, but for such an early game, Astro Fighter is still half decent. Atomic Runner, or Chelnov, whichever you prefer. This 1988 game is definitely one of the more famous Day to East arcades from the decade. You're a radioactive man who somehow survived a nuclear accident, capable of jumping around and firing off all sorts of projectiles on your quest to escape from and destroy the evil Destarians. It's also one of the company's more controversial arcades, mainly in Japan. Chelnov is very close to how Chernobyl is written in Japanese, and with that disaster so fresh in people's minds, the Japanese newspaper Asahi Shimbun raked Data East over the coals due to its clear referencing of the incident, although they tried to explain it away by claiming that Chelnov was actually a relative of Karnov from the earlier game of the same name. Later on, Data East employees did admit that the name came about due to Chernobyl. Either way, Atomic One is a fine arcade, However, this title is very much in the shadow of the later home version of the game released for the Mega Drive, which is an absolute classic and, honestly, better in every aspect. B-Wins, short for Battle Wins, is a 1984 shooter, the sort of game that you would see plenty of times following the release of Namco Xevious a couple of years previously. The gimmick of this game is that the power-ups you get don't just increase the firepower of your ship, they increase its size too, adding attachments to your sides. If you don't have a power-up, you can also take your ship down to the ground, making it act like a tank. This game's not too bad, but I find the style of it to be a bit of an unappealing mess to be honest with you. It all feels a bit too scattershot in how it's presented, and that doesn't appeal to me. There's also a version of this game for the Famicom, released a couple of years later. However, quite a lot of things were changed for the game's release in the home. Bad Dudes 
One of the most popular arcades that Data East released in the 80s, certainly one of the best remembered ones, if only for the gloriously cheesy introduction and the eternal question of whether you're a bad enough dude to rescue Ronnie. Donavest, punch and kick endless members of the Dragon Ninja Clan, proclaim that you're bad at the end of every stage, enjoy a couple of little references to other Data East titles like Karnov and Chelnov, this is still lots and lots of fun. A very successful game here in the UK too, one that kicked around the arcades for years. Occasionally some people balk at the simple punch-kick sensibilities of bad dudes, but sod that. It's a fantastic example of the immediacy and sheer primal satisfaction of a fine arcade. Get in there, beat some goons up and let off some steam. Classic. <laughs> Here's an odd one. Bandit is a game from 1989 that was actually never released for somewhat hazy reasons, but is available in MAME. It's listed as not working, although what's here does seem playable enough. Anyway, this is car combat in a similar vein to Spy Hunter. You're running from the police from city to city, trying to get there inside the time limit and trying to destroy any vehicle that's in your way, otherwise you'll get caught by the police blockade. It's pretty speedy, although yeah, not necessarily the best game. Maybe this one just didn't get through the location testing. The game over is the most memorable part. You actually end up in the chair, and if you don't stick another coin in, you get turned into dust while the message, Crime doesn't pay, flashes on the screen. Other than that, there's not too much to really say about this one. <laughs> Data East released three Laserdisc arcade titles in the 1980s. Here's the first one, Beggar's Battle from 1983, undoubtedly the most obscure of the trio due to it never coming out anywhere else. What we have here is mostly scenes taken from an anime called Harmageddon that's part of the Genma Wars series, with shoot 'em up action overlaid on top of various backgrounds. Most of the amusement comes from the scenes in between the stages. You get some quite awesomely cheesy dialogue that is superbly overacted. But, of course, the shoot 'em up parts themselves are fixed screen and very simplistic. While the backgrounds are obviously lovely, it doesn't really stop the actual gameplay from being almost immediately mind numbing. Not here shall you defeat me, Vega! Birdie Try is a later and much better top-down golf game than the ones we started the video off with, hailing from 1988. It is still very similar to those old games, mind you. The Power Bar gameplay is very much the same, just with souped-up graphics and a few fun little speech samples such as, Nice son! It's a lot cleaner than the older titles, although it still feels quite archaic for the time period. We're not that far away from the much better likes of, say, IOM's major title, after all. Bloody Wolf is up next, another 1988 game and one that would have been called Battle Rangers if you played it in Europe. Bloody Wolf is most certainly more famous as a PC Engine title and the version that's on there is indeed better, but the original arcade still has the slightly souped up one and gun charm with a little bit more claret compared to some of its contemporaries, other little gimmicks like riding a motorbike now and then, and the occasional touch of very cheesy and poorly translated dialogue. The main annoying thing here really is how shoddy this game runs compared to the PC Engine version. Sometimes the optimization on these Data East arcades just isn't the best, it has to be said. Still worth a little look. Here's a different sort of top-down game, Boomer Ranger from 1983, otherwise known as Genesis. 
you play as a caveman, you're armed with a trusty boomerang, and you're on the hunt for treasure that's marked on the map with various letters that spell out the name of the game. Picking up such letters would be a common day to east mechanic. The gimmick here is that this is actually an arcade game about exploration. You've got one big level and you're not forced into a specific path, meaning you can pick up the letters in whichever order you like. However, the island will fill up with tougher enemies as you pick those letters up. You can also mount dinosaurs if you're able to knock an enemy off of them. This is a neat little gimmick and one that you don't often see in such an early arcade game. So yeah, I'd say this is a pretty nifty little title. Data East actually released two versions of First Star's legendary Boulder Dash in the arcade. This is the first one from 1985, exclusively for the Deco cassette system, and it differs a little from the one that was released the previous year by Exidy. In case you didn't realise, Boulder Dash was bloody massive back in the day. Aside from the portrait view you'll find in all Deco cassette games, Data East's first version is pretty straightforward, not too much different in graphical style from the Atari 8-bit original, and as good as ever. Data East would revisit Boulder Dash a few years later in 1990 with all new levels, and obviously much more detailed graphics and sound. Breakthrough from 1986, also known as Forced Breakthrough in Japan, is a horizontal game where you're in a jeep and you can jump a lot. This game seemed to get quite a few ports, you can find it on the NES as well as a bunch of microcomputer platforms, although on the whole I don't think it's one of the company's better titles. It's just quite a frustrating game to play, one where you're in a jeep that's somewhat useless and gets destroyed pretty damn sharpish if you put even the slightest foot one, and where you constantly end up snookered by jumps that you can't make if you lose any bit of momentum. It's like a whole game of Turbo Tunnel and, yeah, I just don't like it one bit, I'm afraid. Also, some of the micro versions of this game were infamously hideous. If you think this is bad in the arcade, don't even think about playing the Amstrad CPC version. Okay, here is a much better game. Bump and Jump, a deco cassette game from 82 that was also released as a regular arcade and known in Japan as Burning Rubber. You take part in a big race where the goal is to get to the finish line while also bashing other cars and trucks into the walls at the side, while also being sure to make the big jumps over the water and the like that are dotted all over the course. However, you do actually get a lot of bonus points if you beat a stage without destroying any of the other cars. You can even wrap around the level. You can jump on the far left and hit something on the far right, if you're skilled enough. An infectious little arcade complete with catchy music and one of my favourites from the company. Our 19th title is another one that doesn't need much of an introduction. Burger Time is one of Data East's greatest and most successful arcade hits. Again, this was originally released as a Deco cassette title in 1982, before going worldwide and coming out for absolutely everything. There's even a version of this game for the frickin' Mattel Aquarius. Peter Pepper climbs those ladders, assembles those delicious burgers with all the fixings, tries to stop all the rogue foodstuffs from getting in his way with his trusty pepper shaker, or by crushing them under the weight of a bun. This is wonderful. A game that's a struggle to stop playing once you get into it, one of the very best arcades of the golden age, and it would be hard to argue against it being Data East's greatest contribution to the world of video games. Well, that or Angler Dangler, obviously. <laughs> Captain Silver is Day Twist's typically uncanny valley take on the world of Swashbuckling, a 1987 game where you have an Errol Flynn-esque hero and you're on the search for treasure. 
While Day to East side scrollers are usually pretty good, I find this to be one of the weaker ones. Perhaps it's just not quite as memorable as something like Karnov, or perhaps there's just a few too many bits of indecipherable weirdness. That, and while it's fairly common to die in one hit in these Day to East arcades, the rather abject weakness of old silver here does get rather annoying. You don't always have ranged attacks at your disposal, and it can be quite easy for enemies to break through your defences. I think the Master System version of this game is slightly better, but on the whole it's not something I ever bother playing. <laughs> Here's one of the weirder games from the Day to East library, Chan Bawa from 1985. This is another side-scrolling game where you play as a samurai, only it has karate champ-esque controls where you use two joysticks to perform various moves. There's a lot of emphasis here on sword fighting. For a game released in 1985, this game is quite spectacularly violent. Winning a fight usually results in you lopping off the head of your opponent, or even cutting them in two. And if you get hit yourself? Well, everything turns black and white, and your end is even more graphic. I have to say that it's pretty rare to find a game of this vintage that makes such a gruesome spectacle out of the player's demise, and I appreciate that about Chan Bawa. You probably need to be able to appreciate the older style of control to get the most out of this game, but I can't help but dig this one. Clash Road is a 1986 arcade game from the rather short-lived Woodplace Inc. that was released by Day to East in some territories, and is another lesser-known game from this vid that's absolutely worth playing. This has the sort of weirdness and humour I would expect from Day to East. It's a cycling game, but one that's extremely violent. You try and bash everyone else into the sides, and you can even punch them in the face too. All the while you have to negotiate various jumps and other obstacles on the road, from oil puddles to roller skaters. Jeez, it's just like biking around central London. Much like Captain Silver, you also get a boost if you collect the letters in the game's title. Here you get a period of invincibility where you send any cyclist who touches you flying. The whole thing comes off like Road Rash's lycra-clad father, and it's an arcade game that's as amusing as it is playable. Definitely worth a go. Clusterbuster is a breakout style game from 1983, but again, it's got a few cool gimmicks. In the West, this game has the rather odd title of Graplop. A weird interpretation, but it does kind of sound like you're lopping off grapes, which is indeed what you do here. The grapes gradually descend towards you and you have to cut them loose, either taking them out one at a time or hitting one that will send a whole load down at once. You do have a wall at the bottom that offers a bit of protection. It does gradually diminish if it gets hit, although it can be repaired if you hit the ball consistently. Also, spiders can pop out of the grapes and take you out if you're not careful. However, if you hit them, you get a power-up that will allow you to pull the grapes back up to the top if they're getting too close to you. On the whole, this is a pretty neat take on a style of game that was already well-worn by 1983, and one that kept me coming back for a little while. Here's our second Laserdisc game, and it's a bit more famous. Cobra Command from 1984, also known as Thunderstorm in Japan, a rather popular game that's had several ports over the years. This is a very flashy looking rail shooter. You make daring flights through various locales, starting with New York City, occasionally blasting down an enemy craft, or making a movement when your co-pilot tells you to do so. The gameplay is a little bit more involved than what you find in Beggar's Battle, and there's a bit more action in the game, although it can't help but still be rather shallow. It is, after all, just a big set of quick-time events that cannot in any way be deviated from. But then that's the nature of the big old Laserdisc beast. The thing that always kneecaps these games is that they're about a thousand times more fun to just watch than they are to actually play. 
Four years later, in 1988, Cobra Command would be revisited, this time for a more conventional arcade game. You're still in charge of a helicopter, but this time it's a regular horizontal shooter. You've got shots and missiles that you power up, and plenty of enemies to administer combustible freedom on. There's also a laser power-up available, although that one can be kind of annoying. Now you probably think that this looks quite generic, and you'd be correct. Even though this doesn't have a jeep, this game does remind me quite a bit of Tecmo's Silkworm, released in the same year, and I'm afraid it can't remotely hope to compete with that title. And as far as this versus the old Laserdisc game goes, well this may have a bit more in the way of gameplay, but the original Cobra Command is certainly a lot more memorable. Now, you may not have thought you'd see Commando here, but it counts as it was licensed today to East for publishing in the West. Capcom's game is another pretty successful one, and one that I've already covered a bit in the past, a seminal run-and-gun shooter where you break through those enemy positions, chucking grenades and firing shots, being sure to cap the general at the end of each stage and all of that. A legendary game in the arcade, just about equally as brilliant in the home, on the Spectrum or C64, this would be the only time that the names of Capcom and Data East came together, but it is one of the decade's greatest games. You will probably be happy to know that Competition Golf Final Round is the last walk-spoiling crooked stick affair in this video. This one came out after the two early ones, but before Birdie Try, and I think it's the best one of the lot. It's not a top-down game, and has a slightly different control system, one that doesn't use a power bar and is actually more similar to something like Golden Tea, where you have to try and perform a clean swing. This makes the game at least a bit more interesting than other bog-standard golf titles of the time, along with some of the odd little visual angles it uses. It's going for a more TV-style presentation, and even if that is crude seeing as this game's from 1985, it at least makes the game stand out. Darwin 4078 is the first title in an evolution-themed series of shooters. You'll recall that we covered the third of these titles, Act Fancer, earlier on. The other two are straighter top-down shooters, and I have to be honest and say that I think that they're amongst the weakest Data East shoot 'em ups Frankly, I just don't get the whole evolution thing. It just feels like a bit of superficial glowing up that, in the end, just masks a rather bog-standard Xevious-type shots and bombs shooter that couldn't hold a candle to the original. If you look into mid-80s arcade games, you end up playing a lot of these, and this one really doesn't stand out at all for me. And yet it was popular enough to entice plenty of operators, particularly in Japan, as well as receive lots of ports and a couple of sequels. So hey, what on earth do I know? Moving once again to the Golden Age, we've got Disco Number no. 1 next, another 1982 game, one that was called Sweetheart in Japan. This is a pretty tricky one. You're Tony Manero in it up, cutting some rug on the dance floor, and the goal is to win the hearts of the silhouettes dancing with you by drawing a rectangle around them, while also avoiding ruffians and anyone else who'd want to throw you out of the club. The gameplay is a little bit like Taito America's kicks in how it plays, although the aims are pretty different. And yeah, getting those rectangles around people is hard, especially when they're moving and all these enemies are following you. You've certainly got to be quick and decisive, that's for sure. This isn't one of my favourites, but the challenge level is enough that I occasionally come back to Disco Number 1, just to see if I can really get to grips with it this time around. <laughs> Disco 
DS Telejan. Okay, there's not much to say about this one. It's a deco cassette game from 1981, and it's Marjon. No frills, no gimmicks, you're straight into the tiles. Unfortunately, I have no idea how to play Marjon, and it really needs a specific controller anyway, so uh, let's just move on. Sorry. <laughs> We're back to the old shoot 'em up pile with Dual Assault from 1984. In Japan, this game is known as Liberation. Why is it called Dual Assault? Well, I'll tell you. It's because you get to play as two vehicles. Quite the concept. In the first part of a stage, you're inside of a helicopter. Everything's vertical as usual, although you do get to control a scroll in this time. You blow up the enemy a bit, and then you land where the hostages are and get to control a tank in a multi-directional shooter affair where you actually go and find them and get a bit more intimate with those evildoers. It's the typically consistent and decently made shooter you would expect from a company like Data East at around this time, really. Perfectly acceptable gaming. Explorer is another title from the Deco cassette pile from early 1982, but this one's got a bit more intrigue about it, if only because it's curious to see an arcade that's clearly quite inspired by Atari's Tempest, only it's not a vector game and it has to deal with some pretty hefty technical limitations. Day Twist do make a good fist of it as it goes. This tunnel does have a little bit of movement to it, and you move about in such a way that could make this a bit of a father to much bigger rail shooter type games to come, such as Sega's Space Harrier. Although of course when Sega started making rail games like Zoom 909 later on in this year, they were a lot smoother than this one. You also get a second type of wave in this one, much like Astro Fantasia, that's a more traditional top-down shooter affair, and there's not much one with that. This may well show its age and limitations, but Explorer is pretty okay on the whole. Express Raider, or Western Express in Japan, is another slab of action from 1986. This time we're going to the wild, wild west. As the title suggests, we're robbing trains, riding on top of them, winning fistfights against anybody who'd dare to stop you, and finally grabbing those bags of cash at the end. There's also the odd segment where you ride alongside the train on horseback, exchanging gunfire with those who are trying to protect the gold and trying not to shoot any innocents. This is a pretty excellent game, really. One of the company's earlier side-scrollers, it would help set up a pretty good formula for Day to East going forward. Fighting Ice Hockey from 1984 is a one seal game. It does exactly what it says on the tin. This is an early ice hockey game, and ugh, there's not a whole lot else to say. It plays okay enough for a game of its time, although there are certainly better competitive sports games of this vintage. I'd just say that this isn't exactly something worth seeking out. <laughs> Fire Trap is another game from Woodplace Inc, and much like Clash Road, it's a little bit different. This 1986 title is an isometric affair where you play as a fireman and you've got to climb up the big Data East USA building because, well, obviously it's on fire. You save employees and their dogs as you go up, and you can also fire water in front of you to try and not get burned or to break up any objects that might be hurtling down towards you. This is essentially an updated take on a once hugely popular Nichibutsu arcade called Crazy Climber, where you have two joysticks, one for your left arm and leg, and the other for your right. I am utterly useless at these games, and it's possible I don't have the configuration set up right, but this is at least somewhat humorous, even if my standard of gameplay here is admittedly quite shocking. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Flash Boy takes us back again, all the way to 1981. It's another Deco cassette system game, and this one was actually known as the Deco Kid in Japan. Perhaps this guy was supposed to be a mascot for Data East at one time? I can't find much record of that, sadly. Alas, his game is not all that good. You fly around and try to punch enemies out of the sky, often using your charge attack in order to beat them to a shot. However, you are a pretty damn weak superhero, seeing as one hit will leave you thoroughly eviscerated to bits. This might have worked a bit better if poor old Flash here was that little bit stronger, but I'm afraid that as it stands, this superhero would have a hard time beating up on the Brooklyn Brawler. Flying Ball from 1985 is, I suppose, the sequel to the earlier Cluster Buster, or Graplop. I say I suppose because in truth, there's not a whole lot different at all about this game. In fact, I first thought it was simply a modification of the original. I guess there's a little more in the way of background. In any case, you've got to do the same thing, only this time it's insects, and the paddle's controlled by a couple of men. Again, you can modify it for straight and wide shots, and a wall offers a bit of protection at the bottom. It's still fun, but there's not a whole lot to differentiate it from the original, and in the end, I'd probably just play Cluster Buster instead. Gao Retsuden from 1987, a game only released in Japan. A lot of Data East 80s arcades feel like the fathers of more famous titles, and here we have the father of Dynasty Warriors, a top-down one and gun based in the world of Romance of the Three Kingdoms. You can pick either Liu Bei, Guan Yu, or Zhang Fei, and you make your way through a bunch of big battle-type stages. It's a perfectly good bit of run and gunning, although there's naturally a bit of Data East weirdness, in that a lot of time you'll be fighting against miniature Karnovs rather than crowds of soldiers. Isn't it funny how one of Day Twist's most notable protagonists actually spent more time as an enemy? You fight more identifiable ROTK characters as bosses, including Lu Bu, who, appropriately enough, acts as the game's final boss. This one is perfectly fine if you fancy a bit of good old-fashioned top-down action. Sticking with 1987, next we have Gondomania, which in Japan has the much better title of Devil Frontier Warrior. This is a straighter shoot-em-up, albeit one with a more fantastical aesthetic, and one that's all about getting money. You pick up coins from every enemy that you kill, and you can then use that money to pick up sub-weapons and other power-ups that are on the ground. You can also aim these sub-weapons in different directions using a rotary joystick, so it certainly pays to blast those ships and get as many coins as you can. This gimmick does at least differentiate the game from more typical shooters, and it's not bad but probably not Data East's best in the shooter department. Heavy Barrel, once again from 1987, is definitely one of the more derivative games that Data East ever released. This is a straight-up rip-off of SNK's Ikari Warriors, complete with that game's rotary joystick control system for aiming in one direction and moving in another. I don't exactly blame Data East for making a take on a game that was as popular as Ikari. People may occasionally forget just how massive a hit SNK's title was, after all, and it spawned tons of imitators. Anyway, you will probably like this if you enjoy the Akari Arcade, although Heavy Barrel does once again suffer from being a bit sluggish in the movement department. Still, it's good if you want more of the same. <laughs> Next, Highway Chase takes us all the way back to 1980 for one of the earliest games in this video. This is a generic shooter with enemies that move in a similar vein to Namco's Galaxian, only it takes place on a road as opposed to in space. And in other forms, this game was also known as Mad Alien. 
This road doesn't really turn anywhere, although there are sections where you go through tunnels, intermittently limiting your view to what you can see right in front of you. As far as early arcade games go, this one is perfectly alright. It's certainly loud and boisterous with sirens blaring everywhere, which is what you would almost expect out of a game of this vintage. Such is the nature of this video that we jump from 1980 all the way to 1989, and we're off to the Hippodrome. And no, we're not going to the casino or watching Magic Mike. This is a fantastical fighting game known as Fighting Fantasy in Japan, and I'm afraid that this may just be my pick for the worst game in the entire video. Hippodrome is dreadful. You play as a slow, lumbering gladiator who has a mere handful of basic attacks, and you clumsily try to win duels against various creatures such as lizardmen, gargoyles, and lamias. It's just a miserable one to play this. Even for 1989, it feels hopelessly out of date in the fighting game genre, an absolute nothingness compared even to the likes of SNK's Street Smart or Taito's Violence Fight. There is very little to redeem this one, I'm afraid. It's terrible. From one of the worst games to one that's very much intriguing, Kamikaze Cabby, also known in Japan as Yellow Cab, is a 1984 title that can only be described as the father of Sega's almighty Crazy Taxi. It's a maze game where you ride around the town, pick up fares and get them to their destination as quickly as possible without destroying your car, ideally knocking any other vehicle that's in your path out of the way. So yeah, it really is Crazy Taxi only 15 or so years earlier. It's not as good as that, of course. One of the rather infuriating things about this title is that it can sometimes take ages to pick up a fare, meaning that you're doing a rather unusually large of aimlessly drifting around for an arcade game. But still, it's a fine concept, and one that would later evolve into a timeless classic. We just had a really terrible fighting game, but now we have one of the most influential of them all, Karate Champ from 1984. Data East didn't actually make Karate Champ themselves, it was developed by their old friends at Technos Japan, and while a lot of people would say this game hasn't held up well over time, it's a crucial foundation of the fighting game genre. If you've never played the game, then you have two joysticks which you use in unison to perform a variety of punches and kicks. You simply have to beat your opponent to the strike, knocking them down in order to score points, with bonus stages dotted between successful bouts. It can be tricky at first, but you get a little used to it after a few rounds. It's the same sort of controls you find in games like Way of the Exploding Fist or International Karate, after all. It should be noted that there are two versions of this game. There's the original, and an updated edition known as Karate Champ Player vs Player that, as you might expect, allowed two people to play against each other. This is the one that Day Twist released internationally as Karate Champ, while the single player only version never left Japan. This game was rightfully massive. It is, in fact, the most successful arcade game that Data East released in their lifetime, according to a 2002 interview with members of their staff. So even if it may not be all that fun to play now, the game's legacy is not to be sniffed at. Earlier, I speculated that the rather lousy Flashboy was possibly an earlier attempt by Day to East at creating a mascot. But while they have plenty of famous characters in their library, Karnov is the one that truly stuck. The big wealthy Russian strongman is Day to East's gift to the world, and the one who appeared in plenty of other games besides his own title, the 1987 game where he, a villain in his life, must go to the underworld and atone for his sins. Karnov's game is perfectly good, of course. 
a jolly nice side scroller where you have a surprisingly large amount of items at your disposal, and you shoot fireballs at all sorts of strange and beautiful creations. The sort of things you might find in Ray Harryhausen helmed fantasy movies and what have you. It could certainly be argued that there were better takes on the original Karnov in the home, particularly on the NES, but it is still a good arcade. That and the game's music is a dark horse contender for being one of the most infectious earworms in arcade history. Up next we have two more Datawist published games, and this duo is going to come at you from the house of Irem. First up is Kid Nikki Radical Ninja, published outside of Japan by Data East in 1986. Another well-made side-scroller where our somewhat punky and oh-so-cool young ninja hero in training twirls a sword around and takes care of business against various other feudally themed enemies. Not to mention the odd boss with a massive head and puffed out cheeks that could shame Dizzy Gillespie. There's a very appreciable sense of humour about Kid Nicky that makes the title a bit enjoyable, even if the gameplay isn't too different from so many other side-scrollers that are out there. Here's another big deal game. Much like Kid Nicky, Data East were responsible for publishing and distributing IOM's Kung Fu Master in North America. This is, of course, another game that needs no introduction. A monumentally influential side-scroller, the architect of the beat-em-up genre, a title that has a remarkably strong narrative for 1984 and, overall, one of the greatest arcade games ever made. While Data East certainly had plenty of very successful in-house games, a significant chunk of their name, especially internationally, was made through publishing Commando, Karate Champ, and this title right here. <laughs> Last Mission is another shooter game from 1986, only this one's a multi-directional shooter where you apparently have to reclaim your honour and return from exile by defeating an alien force. This game is quite similar to Namco's Bosconian. You have to take out the enemy's various fortifications, which are marked out on a grid, and then you get a boss battle at the end of the stage. Not too bad, but quite unforgiving. If you get blown up, you go all the way back to the start of the level, which is pretty vicious. An okay game, but probably not one you would remember for too long after playing it. Lock and Chase is another more high-profile Data East game. It's from 1981, and it's one of their earlier arcade hits. On the surface, it does look somewhat like a Pac-Man clone in that it's a single-screen maze and you have to collect dots, but the twist in Lock and Chase is that you, controlling a supreme thief, can shut all sorts of doors around the maze as you run through it, which is crucial when it comes to avoiding the cops. Other items and treasures that randomly appear in the maze can also freeze them momentarily. This is one of various games that came out in the wake of Namco's almighty yellow juggernaut that added the odd decent extra mechanic to the single screen maze concept, and as such it's held up a lot better than the hordes of more generic pack ripoffs that were hanging around. It's still a compelling arcade that's well worth a go. It should be noted that the Japanese version of this game is rather more blatant about taking from Pac-Man. The sounds were virtually identical to Namco's classic, and they were changed for the Western release. Lucky Poker, on the other hand, is the deco cassette game from 1982 that's probably not worth a go, but then this isn't trying to be much more than a generic video poker machine. It is exactly what you would expect from the title, in short. Not much of anything to say about it, but at least it's preserved. <laughs>
sticking with Ledeco cassettes, here's Manhattan from 1980, another very early game. This one is actually quite cool once you get the hang of it. The aim of the game is to jump very high on a trampoline and make your way up a big skyscraper. What you need to do as you're falling is to try and land on as many balconies as possible, as this is how you earn points, while avoiding the sides and balloons that are in the way. Those will make you crash into the ground. Once you get a bit of a grip on your character's momentum and get a bit more control over his descent, this is a fairly fun early arcade to screw around in. Here's Metal Clash from 1985, another slightly novel take on the beat-em-up genre. Here you're flying around the arena as a mech and you have to punch and kick the various more generic robot enemies before encountering a boss enemy who's going to be wielding something like a sword, a shield or a gun. One of the handy things is that you can actually knock these weapons out of the boss's hands and use them for yourself. If you defeat a boss while holding said weapon, you'll still have it at the start of the next stage. I find this game quite curious actually. This is still the early days of the beat em up genre, and here we have a game that actually predates Technos' highly influential Niketsu Kohakunio kun, or Renegade, by nearly a year. It's a bit more simplistic than that game, but it does have an arena setup as well as weapon pickups. I wonder if there's any other title in the genre that had those earlier than Metal Clash. Hmm, interesting. Perhaps this game deserves to be a bit better known. It's certainly a lot of fun. Midnight Resistance is another famed game, a shooter from 1989 that takes the rotary controls you'd find in something like Ikari Warriors, or indeed Data East's own heavy barrel, and applies them to the side scroll in form of one and gunner. It has the weird mom, sis, dad, please be careful intro, heart pumping music, and some thoroughly legendary power ups. You can quite literally have bullets raining down on your enemies, after all. This is a really good game, although I'm kind of undecided as to whether the rotary system truly works that well. It feels a bit more like a gimmick than something that was really necessary, although there are certainly parts of the game where you need to use it. In the end, I tend to prefer playing this game on one of its many home versions, either the Mega Drive for a superb and very accurate port, or the ZX Spectrum for a tremendous conversion that punches way above its weight. Still, those obviously wouldn't exist without the original arcade. Another entry, and another shoot 'em up. This is Mission X from 1982. The plot here is, as usual, somewhat inconsequential. You're simply in charge of a plane, and you either have to bomb targets on the ground or shoot them out of the sky, depending on what part of the stage you're in. You can also control your altitude, apparently making it easier to bomb fins, and you occasionally make a very brief landing on a strip. If you're able to touch the ground here, you get some bonus points. I find this game to be quite infuriating, particularly when you're on bombing ones. It's so tough to actually bloody hit anything, so a lot of this game seems to be just throwing bombs around haphazardly and hoping that you might actually hit a bullseye once in a while. This is the exact sort of thing that Namco's Xevious would do a great deal better in the same year, and it's easy to see why a game like Mission X would be just about completely forgotten today. Mysterious Stones is another game from Technos Japan, released in 1984. Happily, it's more interesting than the last entry. This is another arcade that's based around exploration, one where you control an explorer named Dr. Kick, who ventures into the various rooms in a temple, kicks the various egg-shaped artefacts in order to reveal treasure, has a gun that he can use to shoot any demonic enemies that may be lurking around, and may occasionally have to escape quickly from lava or other traps if he spends too much time in the room. There's no prizes to be had for guessing what Technos' inspiration was on this title, I'm afraid. 
As far as unofficial Dr. Jones games go, this is a rather entertaining one, even coming with faint wisps of the classic indie music, and having enough little tricks about it to be rather satisfying and worth coming back to. Decent stuff. <laughs> Nebula is another very early deco cassette game, again it's from 1980. In fact this game is almost exactly like the earlier Highway Chase, only it's in the more traditional setting of space, you know, the final frontier and all of that. Other than that, the gameplay is virtually identical. What's more interesting is the fact that this was incredibly obscure for a long time, in fact it was only dumped and made available on MAME a year or so ago. There are other virtually unknown deco cassette games out there that are still yet to be dumped, existing only in the hands of private collectors, including such curiosities as a ninja-based title named Sengoku Ninja Tai, or a game based on Gateball, or rather Quoke, which is certainly a unique premise for an arcade title. Is it another space shooter that I see before me? Why, yes it is, although this one's quite enjoyable for an early one. Nightstar from 1983's gimmick is that you're slowly yet surely building a space station, shooting as many of the alien ships that are obviously in your way as you can. Generic? Well, yes, but it moves at a decent enough pace for a deco cassette game, so it's definitely fine enough for a quick little 5 minute blast, even if I can imagine this game making some people roll their eyes in disdain back in 1983. There were, after all, a hell of a lot of space shooters out there. <laughs> Nightstar is certainly more interesting than the next title, Ocean to Ocean from 1981. This is another deco cassette game and, well, it's a video fruit machine. Nothing more, nothing less. The most curious thing about this title, really, lies in the cabinet. This would run inside a specially modified deco cassette cab, complete with a lever, that would allow the game to function more like a traditional one-armed bandit and give out medals if you win. I presume that the earlier Lucky Poker would have a similarly unique setup compared to normal deco cassette games. Either way, yeah, it's slots. Up next, it's Uzumu the Grand Sumo from 1984. It is pretty rare to see a sumo game in the arcade, and this may well be the first one ever. Needless to say, it only came out in Japan. The game's rules are pretty simple. You get a bit of the ceremony, the rekishis come together, there's a bit of button mashing, and then you either have to try and execute a move, or defend yourself against one, depending on how you do. The bouts themselves are usually over pretty quickly and… yeah, there's not too much to say about this. There are certainly sumo games that are a bit more detailed and involved than this one, even from this generation, but it is interesting to see this in an arcade format. Performan is up next, a game from 1985 that is actually a pretty early arcade game from the almighty Toa Plan. This is somewhat different to the shooter action you may expect from them. Here you have to eliminate enemies by coaxing them towards these fins called mecha stones that you then blow up when they're close by with the help of your trusty boomerang. The enemies are pretty good when it comes to tracking you down, meaning that you'll have to dig your way into the ground, making use of barriers and the like in order to give you a bit of breathing space. Weirdly, it reminds me a bit of Disco Number no. 1 when it comes to the complexity and difficulty of what you have to do inside just a single screen. A tough game, and not necessarily a bad one, it's just one that's going to take a bit of time playing for you not to die immediately. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Speaking of tough games, the next one may just be the most challenging in Data East's library, although not in a good way. Peter Pepper's Ice Cream Factory from 1984 is, as you can probably tell, a follow-up to Burger Time, although here our chef has now switched over to the dessert section, rolling scoops of ice cream into cones. Or trying to, anyway. Everything about this is frustrating, whether it's attempting to kick those scoops up or down to other platforms, or, even worse, trying to get rid of the usual parade of nasty foodstuffs using them. Alas, this one is nowhere near Burger Time, and as such, it's easy to see why it's not that well known despite being a follow-up to such a famous title. Up next, we have Pocket Gal. This is a title from 1988, and it's all about Paul. It's the sequel to a game we'll be covering in a little while called Side Pocket, and in some areas, weirdly, it was known as Pocket Gal 2. Generally, this is a pretty regular top-down Paul game. If you've ever played Side Pocket on the Mega Drive, this will be very familiar. However, it does have a little twist, at least in the Japanese original. You play against various women, and if you beat them, then this happens. Oh, blimey! Don't get too many of those to the pound! Whoa, etc. So yes, this is one of Data East's more adult-themed games. Needless to say, the big undressing doesn't happen if you play the Western version of the game. Other than that, yeah, it's arcade pull, although there are a couple of bonuses for hitting certain pockets and so on. Jeez, Data East did do quite a lot of sports games, more than you would probably think in fact. We've got a whole bunch of them coming, but first we've got Pro Baseball Skill Tryout from 1985. This is different from the typical baseball norm in that it's actually a lot more like track and field. You have five events that test out your baseball skills, starting with hitting and then going to throwing, pitching, base stealing and finally fielding. So yes, it's a baseball meets athletics mashup with a lot of button bashing involved. Annoyingly, I just couldn't get past the throwing section. Clearly, I'm not built for the field of dreams. It's still baseball, but at least it's a bit different. <laughs> The next three titles are probably best taken as one entry. It's a trio of Deco Cassette sports games, all of which are quite early and rather simplistic. Pro Bowling is, well, 10-pin bowling, a very straightforward take where you decide what sort of curve you want and the power and then uh, not much else really, if you strike or you don't. Pro Tennis is a very early title, the sort where you really need to get the ball on the racket in order to return it. Quite unforgiving and certainly not the prettiest of titles either. And then we have Pro Soccer. This is by far the more interesting of the three, if only because of just how crude it is. It's more like practice. You always start with a kickoff and you only ever play with the ball. Ideally, you end up scoring after passing the ball along a bit. But if you don't, if the goalie saves or you miss or even if the ball ends up with the other team, the action stops and you go straight to another kickoff. Weird and amusingly primitive, even if it hardly makes for a decent footy game. Okay, we're away from sports for now, and happily we've got a pretty damn good game next. Psycho Nick's Oscar is another one of Data East's high quality side scrollers from 1987, a game that was absolutely good enough to go beyond the arcade and into the home, but surprisingly never did. This is similar to the later Act Fancer in that you play as a mech and take on various other robots and enemies in a setting that's a bit of a mix between sci-fi and fantasy, but here you have a Gradius-esque power-up system. It all starts with getting a bigger jump, and as long as you survive it can progress to having some thoroughly awesome firepower complete with missiles, options, grenades and all sorts. But of course, it all goes away if you happen to get blown up. 
A tremendous little game this one. It's another simple yet excellent little twist on the regular old side-scroller and it should absolutely be played. Another notable thing about this game is that later on, in a 2006 interview for Retro Gamer, Manfred Trenz of Rainbow Arts would cite Oscar as one of the main inspirations for his almighty Turrican, talking about how much he loved playing the game at his local arcade in Dusseldorf, and the resemblance is most definitely there. We're keeping the quality going with the next one, and it's a licensed game too. The Real Ghostbusters is another 1987 title, based on the cartoon, where a group of wisecracking spectre hunters use those proton beams not just to take enemies out, but also to trap their souls. The more souls you take, the more points you'll end up with at the end of each stage. It's a top-down game, as you can obviously see. It could be said that it's in a similar vein to Gauntlet, although there is a much more blatant take on Atari's game coming soon. In any case, this is one of my favourite Ghostbusters titles. This sort of top-down run and gun esque game is admittedly right in my arcade wheelhouse, and I find it very enjoyable. It should be mentioned that the original Japanese release of this game was very different. It didn't have the Ghostbusters license, instead being called Make You Hunter G. A lot of the sprites are different, there's a couple less levels, and the game is considerably harder in its Japanese incarnation. The Western version is definitely the way to go here. Rinkin, aka Kin of Boxer, is a 1985 title by Wood Place that Data East distributed in the States. And of course, it's a boxing game. This is a bit more of a simulation of boxing than most other arcade efforts in the genre, seeing as you're actually able to use the whole ring and circle around your opponent, and it was somewhat successful in its time. It does also have a few arcade sensibilities, such as special attacks and the like. It's not bad, although it's not quite up there with the likes of Nintendo's Punch-Out in terms of sheer fun. For completion's sake, the NES version of Rinkin was the only Data East game to make it to any of Nintendo's arcade multi-systems. It was available on the Versus system as Versus TKO Boxing. The third and final Data East Laserdisc game is Road Blaster from 1985. Chances are, this one's known better nowadays as Road Avenger. This is, by a long distance, the best of Data East's Laserdisc titles, and is in fact one of the best Laserdisc games ever made. Is that a particularly huge accolade? Well, possibly not, but for as much as this is still the exact sort of QTE-based gameplay you would find in something like Dragon's Lair, Road Blaster gets by almost entirely on the sheer quality of the production, absolutely going wild in your sports car, smashing up other cars and bikes, driving through everything, all sorts of stunts. Yeah, that totally works. It's the anime version of the classic French short film Set à en Rendezvous, and it is glorious. I only wish that this arcade version also had the brilliant and cheesy intro song that was in the Mega CD port. One neat little factoid about this game. It, as well as Cobra Command, were headed up by Yoshihisa Kishimoto, who'd go on to create Renegade and Double Dragon, and the car from this game, based on a Firebird Trans Am, is the same car that's in Billy and Jimmy Lee's garage at the beginning of Double Dragon. So now you know. Okay, here's another big one. The future of law enforcement is here, in the shape of Robocop, Data East's 1988 game of the movie, made possible thanks to a deal with Ocean Software. Naturally, Data East makes a side-scroller out of Murphy's antics. You start off just by punching thugs, but it's not long before you're pulling out the Auto 9 and blasting those quims with extreme prejudice. The game's pretty tough, the sort where you only get one energy bar that can go down pretty quickly if you're not careful, although Data East did make sure to give most everyone a satisfying enough Robocop experience, giving people a fight against the Ed 209 at the end of the first stage that may not be movie accurate, but is exactly what folks would have wanted from this game. 
This was another big hit in the arcades, big enough that one particular territory, Hong Kong, then home to Flashback, reportedly the world's biggest video game arcade, said that it was their most successful game in 1988. Rootin' Tootin' is another deco cassette game from 1983, also known as La Pa Pa, and it's another maze game with something of a musical twist. The twist here is that you're a tuba, and you have to collect the notes on the staves. If you collect them in a sequence, they'll run a scale, and they'll also fly off in front of you, knocking out any of the rogue musical instruments that are in their path. It may well be a fair bit like Pac-Man, perhaps even more so than the earlier Lock and Chase, but that doesn't stop the game from being rather engaging. I'd recommend giving it a little try if you enjoy the classic single-screen maze arcades. We've got another odd game, or at least something you wouldn't expect. Here's Scrum Try, a deco cassette game from 1984. Now there are not a lot of rugby games around in general, I certainly can't think of another arcade rugby game, so the fact that the only one that likely exists was made in 1984 by a Japanese studio most definitely speaks to the slight tinge of weirdness that makes Datoist special, although the sport has always enjoyed popularity in Japan. More than that, it's actually a pretty good rugby game. It's quite simple, naturally. You pass the ball around when you've got it, make tackles when you don't, and generally try to break through the opponent's formations. But yeah, it works, and is very easy to pick up. Naturally, there's scrums and conversions and all of that too, and it plays a hell of a lot better than Daytoist's earlier attempt at football. In fact, I would say it's one of their best attempts at a sports game. Quite a nice surprise. <laughs> Our next game is Shackled from 1986. In Japan this was called Braywood, and it's best summed up simply as Data East does Gauntlet. Much like that game, you've got dungeons to explore, exits to find, doors to unlock, many enemies to shoot, and a power meter that will gradually go down. Although Shackled does differentiate itself a little by allowing you to use said keys to open jail doors and find your friends, who you can then use for a time. They'll fire special weapons alongside your main shot. It's an alright game list, but I think that Daytoist had some better takes on the gauntlet formula later on with isometric titles like Dark Seal, which alas we won't be covering because it was released in 1990. Shootout hails from 1985, and it's a pretty cool one. This one's all about target shooting, but it's similar to later games like Cabal in that you can move your guy around, dodge shots, and take a bit of cover. One of the main reasons why this is pretty enjoyable is because each stage comes with a lot of hidden bonuses, usually hinted at in the intro. It is quite satisfying too, for example, in the midst of all the gangsters trying to take you down, hit the roller coaster at the one point where you can actually fire a shot at it for a big point boost. This may be a little bit simpler than something like Cabal, but it still feels good to play, and it does a very good job of the hard-boiled gangster town noir style setting. Side Pocket is Data East's first pool game, released in 1986. They'd make a couple more over the years, and we've already seen Pocket Gal earlier in this video. Unlike that game, Side Pocket doesn't feature any ladies that'll take their clothes off if you win, so yes, it's basically just a generic top-down straight pool simulator, one that you'll play for a short while until you inevitably get bored, which probably won't be that long. Thank you. 
Skater from 1983 takes us kicking and screaming back to the world of the Deco cassettes, although this perhaps isn't the more generic game that you may expect from the title. In Skater, you play as a clown who's got really long legs, and the idea is to collect items by having them pass between those legs. You can stretch your legs out a bit to help with this, something which is usually essential when you've got a row of objects, and is definitely needed when you have to deal with moving enemies that will instantly end you if you even slightly brush against them. This game can get pretty challenging and frustrating, it must be said. I think it's the sort of thing that might have been better with just a little more polish. Another pretty big titles on the way, it's Slice Spy one of Data East's very best side-scrollers from 1989, and also known as Secret Agent, Sly Spy should really be considered one of the best James Bond games of all time, even if it doesn't actually have the official licence. It's absolutely chock full of references to the films, fancy sports cars, a hand-to-hand -hand boss fight against Jaws, a literal golden gun power-up, giant sharks underwater, a council for world domination, Hell, you can even specify your code number in the beginning, which serves absolutely no purpose except to stick 007 in there. As blatant as this game is, it's a wonder that the infamously protective folks in charge of the Bond IP didn't sue Data East to hell and back. But they got away with it, and the result is a fantastic little arcade, one that I have so many great memories of playing back in the day, and still holds up brilliantly now. SRD Super Real Darwin is the direct sequel to Darwin 4078, released in 1987, although if you played this on the Mega Drive, you would know it as Darwin 4081, which is kind of confusing. Once again, the gimmick is that your ship evolves and takes on various forms as you obtain power-ups, rather than just getting stronger in terms of firepower. Not all that much different from the original, although the graphics have been cleaned up a bit. Evolutionary stuff aside, I find this to be rather cumbersome. I am sure that some people enjoy these Darwin titles, but I have never been able to get into them. Act Fancer was absolutely the best out of the lot of them, and annoyingly that was the only one that didn't get any home version whatsoever. Stadium Hero from 1988. It feels like it's taken us a real long time to get a proper baseball game. All we've had so far is that strange baseball athletics hybrid title. Thankfully, Stadium Hero is here to provide the inevitability. If you're going to cover games from a Japanese studio from this generation, baseball titles are absolutely certain to feature. Ten a penny lay maybe, but Stadium Hero is quite an irritating one. I really dislike the field in here, because it feels like they always make awful and illogical moves before I'm able to start controlling them, and that usually ends up with me chasing balls that I feel like I should have been able to handle. Other than that, yeah, forget about this and just go and play SNK's Baseball Stars. There is quite literally no point in playing this at all unless you're desperate to play every one of the million mediocre baseball games released by Japanese studios in the 80s and 90s. Super Astro Fighter is the 1981 sequel to plain old Astro Fighter, released for the Deco cassette system. The gameplay hasn't changed all that much, you still have to deal with the various waves of enemy ships before you run out of fuel, although the graphics have certainly improved and you do get different and quicker patterns, some of which are more reminiscent of Galaxian than they are of Space Invaders. This is definitely still a challenge, but better than the original. I was even able to reach the end of a wave here, where you land a few shots at the alien mothership with whatever fuel you have left and then, if you succeed, replenish your fuel from the defeated enemy in preparation for the next wave. This is perhaps not too heralded these days when it comes to the old fashioned space shooters, but I would say Super Astro Fighter is worth a go. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> 
Super Doubles Tennis from 1983, on the other hand, is the sequel to the earlier Pro Tennis, and as such is a much more forgettable affair. Obviously there's two extra people on the court, and the graphics have at least had a bit of a clean up, much needed seeing as the original was vociferously ugly even for 1982. However, in the end, it's still the same utterly middling tennis game, just with a bit more music and sound effects. Let's be honest, chances are the only people who would take enough interest in this game to actually fire it up are nitwits like me who are in the process of making a YouTube video like this one. The chances of anyone playing this without also having OBS or whatever one in the background are virtually zero. <laughs> Tag Team Wrestling from 1983 is one of the earliest pro wrestling games you'll find in the arcade, and it's another game by Technos Japan, also known as the Big Pro Wrestling. You play as a team that's clearly somewhat based on the real-life B.I. Cannon, that being Giant Bubble and Antonio Inoki, against a pair of opponents called the Mad Maulers, consisting of one smaller guy and a bigger heavyweight. This game is basically all about grappling. You keep on getting close, initiating grapples, and waiting for action to pop up on your side. When it does, you have to quickly select a move and use it. Anything from a nutter, which is a headlock, to the rather amusingly named rabbit killer, which is Inoki's back brain kick. It pays to keep on trying grapples, otherwise your opposing wrestler will get angry, and naturally you've got to tag out every once in a while. It's not bad, I guess. It's something of a landmark when it comes to the pro wrestling genre of games, as it's so early on, but obviously it would be surpassed pretty sharpish. <laughs> Tyranian is another very early deco cassette game, coming from 1980, and it's another one from the space shooter pile. Your job in this one is to protect the planet up top. Enemy formations will swoop in and after trying to take you out, they'll start working on the planet's defences. If they get through them, the planet will quite literally blow up, two tribe style, and you'll lose the game. Seeing as your ship moves in that typically slow Galaxian style with not too many shots and all of that, protecting your home planet won't exactly be easy. A cool enough gimmick here, but it's not quite as immediate as something like Astro Fighter. Tomahawk 777 is another 1980 vintage shoot 'em up, only this time you're underwater. You play as a submarine, and enemies either drop mines into the water or attempt to dive bomb you. It's something of a simplified Galaxian, although the submarine can move up and down as well as left and right. You can move right up to the top of the water level, although that slowly goes down as the battle continues on until you manage to get rid of the wave. Simple and effective, the sort of thing you've no doubt played many times before, and you probably wouldn't give this one too many looks in the end. Tornado from 1982 is a bit more interesting. This is a tube shooter affair comparable to the game Explorer that we looked at way earlier in the video. Much like that game, this also has a lot in common with Atari's Tempest. The goal here is to protect the capsules that are at the edge of the well from the enemy. You can move around freely, of course, but they cannot. Your robot can shoot down the well and is virtually immune to a fair few of the different types of enemies, although you must watch out for the mines that come up the tunnel, as those will definitely take you out. It's alright this one, although on the whole I prefer Explorer, as it's got a bit more going on. We're still in those early deco cassette days, and here we have another very rare game that is, well, not good. The Tower from 1981 is exactly what it looks like, a very cheap ripoff of Nichibutsu's Crazy Climber. Crazy Climber is an arcade that performed reasonably well in the West, but was a commercial juggernaut in Japan. In 1980, only Pac-Man and Galaxian made more money in the territory, according to the old Japanese trade paper Game Machine. 
Naturally, some folks would look to rip it off, and that's what Data We Star doing here. It's Crazy Climber, only much worse, and with a lady as the hero. It's so blatant, in fact, that Data East didn't bother to include their copyright on the title screen, which some folks have speculated was due to them really not wanting to get sued. This has been made available to play relatively recently, and even if it is terrible, it's still amusing to see such a comical rip-off job. We've got another deco cassette game, our second to last, and it's Treasure Island from 1981. This is a game where you have to make your way up an island that's gradually sinking into the sea, picking up treasure as you go, and avoiding any enemies that are looking to knock you into the water. The paths that you can move on are rather neatly laid out, and there's also doors that you can use to reach other areas of the stage, and you'll certainly need to keep aware of them, because the enemies are pretty direct. This game actually represents an arcade first. Treasure Island is the first ever released title to use isometric graphics. However, usually that honour is given to Sega Zaxxon, largely because that was the first isometric arcade to be released internationally, and it is admittedly a considerably better looking and playing affair, far more successful than this game ever was. Still, Treasure Island did actually beat it by at least a couple of months, and it itself is not a bad title at all. A fair few of Data East's titles fall into the weird category, but there is absolutely no arcade by them as strange, surreal, and perhaps as wonderful as Trio La Punch Never Forget Me. While some say that this side-scrolling beat-em-up actually came out in 1990, it does have a copyright date of 1989 on its title screen, so I'm going to count it. It's very much worth talking about, after all. This whole game is something of a wild parody of all things Data East, one that was initially designed as a Sugoroku board game before changing to a more typical format during production, although elements like the Wheel of Chance in between stages do reflect those origins. Some of the studio's most famous characters make plenty of appearances, particularly Karnov. When you fight a big posed statue of him at the end of the first stage, you know you're in for quite the ride. This is one of the funniest arcade games ever. There is perhaps nothing more hilarious than the one stage where you tell a Karnov to stop assaulting a turtle, and he simply responds with, I will anyway. There's many other flashes of brilliance that I could mention, but this is the sort of game that you think wouldn't ever leave Japan, but it's to everybody's benefit that it did. The play's right up there with Data East's usual high quality side scrollers, and the comedy of it all gives the game a big edge absolutely an arcade classic. The high standard continues with 1989's Vapor Trail, or Vapor Trail Hyper Offense Formation, to give it its full title. Is this the best of Data East 80s arcade shooters? Well, looking at the rest of the list I've got here, it's pretty easy to say yes. This is awesome blast in action, filled with the typical big weapons and a few necessary touches like being able to actually cycle through those weapons and doing the odd bowel roll here and there to avoid shots, as well as the sort of action you would expect from the best shoot em ups of the late 80s. Vapor Trail is right up there. And even if it doesn't have too much music, the main theme of the game is one of the greatest shoot em up tracks of all time whether here or on the also very good Mega Drive port. It's another outstanding title that should be played immediately. We're definitely finishing quite strong from the looks of Finns. Just as Daytwist published IOM's original Kung Fu Master in North America, they did the same for Vigilante in 1988, the game's more street-savvy follow-up. Can you rescue the fair Madonna by punching and kicking everything in sight, occasionally twirling around some nunchucks to administer some serious headaches? Well, it's certainly worth a try. 
Vigilante doesn't radically change the core formula of Kung Fu Master, but aside from a wholly different setting, it does add a greater range of enemies and some more complex boss fights, not to mention the aforementioned weapons that our heroic street tough has at his disposal. It's still got the same speed about it, hurrying you along and making sure you deal with waves as fast as possible before you get punched, kicked and hugged to your demise. A fine way to make a spiritual sequel to a legendary arcade game. Lesser known than the last handful of titles, but still worth having a look at, is Wonder Planet from 1987. This is Day Twist's attempt at a cute em up, in the same vein as Sega's Fantasy Zone or Konami's Twin Bee. Indeed, Wonder Planet wholly takes the shop system from Fantasy Zone, plunking them down in the middle of stages and allowing you to buy engines, shields, and limited time special weapons. The actual gameplay is a top-down shooter with the Xevious formula of using shots and bombs, it plays fine and the bright cuteness is certainly there, although this being day twist you can expect a couple of odd fins. Perhaps strangest of all is that when you lose a life, a big message flashes onto the screen proclaiming that you are dead. Now you don't exactly expect that from a cute em up, do ya? That's rather funny. And the rest of the game is perfectly good. Check it out if you like some bright pastel colours with your shooting escapades. We've got another shooter coming at you, Zaviga from 1984. This is a bit more conventional when it comes to shots and bombs, like so many other games that followed in the wake of Namco's Xevious, although this also functions as something of a cousin to Day Twist's own B Wins. Both games were released in 1984, and both allow you to mess with the altitude of your ship, allowing it to become a tank when it's on the ground. I think that Zaviga does a better job of this gimmick than B Wins. The graphical style is a lot clearer here, thankfully, and while it's a little bit slower on the whole, I think that actually makes the title a bit nicer to play out and learn. It might seem odd for Day Twist to release two games like Zaviga and B Wins that are so similar to each other in quite close proximity, but then that's not exactly unheard of back in this era of the arcade. <laughs> Zero Eyes is the final Deco cassette game that we're covering, and seeing as it came out in 1983, I presume that it's one of the later ones to be released on that system. Thankfully, it's also one of the better ones. This is the sort of game that you could describe as a bumper car title, one where you control a vehicle and win by smashing the opposing cars into the wall. In many ways, it's an evolution of old discrete logic games like Exidy's Destruction Derby from 1975, and it's quite fun to do. The key to Zero Eyes is the turbo, that's how you really have the best chance of smashing those cars into the wall, and as your opponents get bigger you've got to be more and more ready to save yourself if you're sent hurtling towards the barriers. Usually you can do that, so long as you've got enough space. This is the sort of arcade that will happily satisfy those primal urges to break fins and destroy. <laughs> Zippy Bug, or Noble Anchor as it is also known, is a rather cutesy 1986 game published by Daytwist and developed by Corland, who previously did quite a few games for Sega. In fact this actually runs on Sega's own System 1 arcade hardware. This is another shoot em up of sorts, one that also mixes in a bit of Crazy Climber. You have to make your way up the tree in order to rescue Princess Pudding, taking out the various insects that are out to stop you. All of these insects tend to drop fruit when you take them out, although you have to be a little careful. They can also drop skulls, and those will also make you lose a life if you touch them. This is quite a good game, not the most memorable, and Wonder Planet is certainly the better cutesy title, but it is fun for a little play here and there. And here we are, the final game of the video. We've made it all the way to Zor from 1982. 
It's not necessarily the most memorable of endings. It's another shoot 'em up, and indeed another one where you get to control the altitude, making it another forerunner to games like Zaviga and B Wins. In fact, this is very similar to Mission X, a game which was released in the same year. You can still land on a one way for bonus points, and you still may have a fair bit of trouble hitting targets, that tending to happen more from luck and spamming the button as opposed to it being in any way calculated. Much like the earlier case of Highway Chase and Nebula, the only major difference here is in the sprites. This game does at least feel a little cleaner in that department. Is this a spectacular ending to our journey through Data East's 80s arcades? Well, no. But hey, it is an ending. While it would be tempting to purposely misspell the game so that we could have something like, I don't know, Zerga Time as the big finish, that's probably not something I should do. So, there we are. Just what have we learned from this whole escapade? Well, we've learned that a company mascot doesn't have to be conventionally appealing to be legendary, that you can reference just about anything in an arcade game from the lens sitting US president to Michelangelo's dying slave sculpture, and get away with it even if you're basically blowing a big raspberry at copyright law, that no one cared a whole lot if you just went ahead and released two virtually identical arcade games at near enough the same time, and that going through titles alphabetically may not necessarily give you the best beginnings and endings, but there'll be a whole load of meat in between those burger buns. Naturally there are many other famous arcade companies I could do this again with, but Data East felt like a great way to kick things off. Again, even if they're probably not your favourite arcade company, they most certainly weren't ever boring, that's for sure. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video, and until the next time, bye for now.